All right, well, hey, welcome everybody in the room. Thank you. Everybody tuning in online, our Ports Live locations, and especially Ports North Houston, Ports Midland, Ports Boise, Ports Des Moines, Ports uh, Scottsdale, all the different live locations. Everybody joining us. We're continuing the series POV, looking at interactions that particular men and women had with the Son of God when he was on the planet. Let me start with a story, an illustration that'll kind of set up where we're gonna go. In the spring of 2012, I made the decision that I wanted to ask the girl I was dating to marry me. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, thanks guys. And I came up with a plan, I had it all thought through. I was going to ask her and I planned to ask her on her birthday. Why? Because I assume that she knew that asking on her birthday is, you know, one of those almost goes without saying, cliche, everyone would think to do that, so I'm gonna reverse psychology this and do it then. And I came up with a plan. It also allowed me to fly under the radar of putting a birthday celebration together because that's just what you do. You're doing a birthday thing. And then at the end of that celebration, I'd be able to pop the question. So the plan was to pick her up in the morning. We were gonna go out to the lake and kayak at White Rock here in Dallas. We were then gonna go and I set up like a spa day. This is your birthday gift. Go to the spa. I'll pick you up at four o'clock. We're gonna go to the Arboretum and then we'll go to dinner. Now, I called the Arboretum that day to make sure, like this is how like, thought through it was, or Inception-esque it was. I wanted to make sure that I, at any point, if she was on the trail, I was gonna throw her off the trail. And so I called the Arboretum to confirm it was closed that day. I wanted to make sure that in case she suspected anything, like, man, this seems like a lot of things, I would put in little you know, uh, breadcrumb trails, so to speak, to throw her off. And so we'd show up at the Arboretum, and it'd be like, oh, this is closed. And so she'd be like, oh, he would have for sure thought through this if he was gonna ask me to marry me. So we go to the lake, we kayak, she goes to the spa, pick her up, take her to the Arboretum. Little did I know that while I'm thinking, we're gonna show up to the Arboretum, and I called multiple times, like, hey, I need to make sure for sure it is closed. I need to show up, you're gonna tell us it's closed, sir. Yes, sir, we're gonna be closed. Because I had planned that I'd be like, oh, well, we got still time before dinner, so you know, let's go to this park down the road and we'll just kind of hang out where I had two of my boys hiding in the bushes to take pictures. <laughs> so the day comes, we go kayaking, it's great. She goes, does the spa thing, I pick her up, we go to the Arboretum, we show up, and I pull up to the gate and it's closed. And I'm going, man, this is going right according to plan. <laughs> She's thinking, we're getting engaged, and he did not even think to call ahead to see if this place was open. She, for whatever reason, had still been on the trail, and I'm like, oh, man, well, it's closed. Oh, no, and I can visibly tell she is, there's a change in what's going on. Her expectations, <laughs> I'm going, oh, no. She, oh, no. So I'm like, oh, no, this would be great. We're going to go to dinner, and let's go to this park over here, and, um, you know, we'll, I just happen to have some bread. We'll feed the ducks. And I pull out the bread. <laughs> We're going to feed the ducks. And then Mother Nature strikes and it starts raining. And I'm like, oh man, this is not going according to plan. But I brought an umbrella. And so I pull out the umbrella, but there's no, thank you very much, thank you. There's no casual way to show, to without throwing off, like this is just bizarre, um, to go out with an umbrella and it's raining. And she's like, no, we're not gonna feed the ducks. No, I got an umbrella where it doesn't look weird. Like, no, no, these ducks, they're very hungry. We need to go. <laughs> feed them. And she's like, uh, okay. And so I'm like over there with the umbrella and I'm like walking. It was so muddy that I had to pick her up. She had a piggyback ride over to the lake by the umbrella. I get over there and I'm just trying to play it cool. And of course I'm on the inside just freaking out. And I'm starting to rip the bread apart and I'm throwing it to this ducks. It's over here in Highland Park, throwing the bread in the water and the ducks come up to it and then just swim right off. Like even the ducks in Highland Park are stuck up. What is this, Baird's? <laughs> And uh, I'm totally kidding, don't email me, it's a joke, people. Okay, anyway, so we're doing the bread thing. Eventually, I say, you know what, we're just done with this. And I get to the place after reading some things and telling her some things, and I hit one knee and ask her the most important question I'll ever ask for another person. And she says, yes. Yeah, thank you. Now. What does that have to do with tonight? Well, in that scenario, it was asking the most important earthly question, if you will, that 
I'll probably ever ask. And her answer to that question would dramatically shape the future she would have and the future I would have. And tonight, we're gonna look at a conversation that involves a man coming to Jesus with specific questions. And Jesus' answers to those questions are going to dramatically shape the future this man will have and the eternal life this man will have. And they are the same answers to the same question that if you don't get right, or depending on how you answer them, is going to dramatically shape the future you're gonna have for now and for all of eternity. And I think there are some people in the room who have been asking and wondering this question and the questions that Jesus is going to answer as it relates to who will spend eternity with God, how you can have a relationship with God, and what the heart of God is really like. And I think God has you here tonight so that for the rest of the rest of however many days ahead God has for you, you can have certainty that you have the answers to the most important questions, not you're gonna ask to another person, but you'll ever ask, period, and that God has given you the correct answers. So we're gonna be in John chapter three. John chapter three is an exchange between a teacher and a famous teacher at the time and Jesus. And it's a man who had questions about who this new rabbi, I mean, this is super early in, in Jesus' ministry. He just started, he basically just appeared on the scene. Chapter two, he does his first miracle, changes water into wine, word starting to spread. And this well-known religious leader shows up and he says, man, I've just got some questions. And Jesus walks through and gives us really two things that I wanna highlight. There's a lot we could unpack, but I just wanna quickly unpack two things that give us the answers to some of the most important questions you're ever going to ask. Answers that will determine whether you're going to spend eternity with God or not. And answers that sadly most of our world and many people who even think that they're Christians have gotten and are getting wrong. So we're going to be in verse one of chapter three. And the book of John is unique in that it is 90% different from the other gospels. So the four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, have striking similarities and years after they were written, it's like the Apostle John, who has this really intimate relationship with Jesus, decides, man, there were just some stories that I have got to write. And so the Holy Spirit leads him to write the book of John. And it gives us the interactions and the account of this man named Nicodemus, a man who would show up at the beginning of John and eventually show up at the end of John. So I'm going to start in verse 1, and we'll get started from there. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus. Now, Pharisee, you probably, I'll unpack a little bit more in a second, but Pharisees, here you always get a note. They were of an incredibly exclusive club. In a city of a million people, there were 6,000 Pharisees. That was it. They were professional religious leaders. In other words, they had made their devotion to God so abundant that they did it for a living. And this was one of them, one of the exclusive 6,000. He was also a member of the Jewish ruling council. Now, in a city that large, there's... Unique to be 6,000 or one of the 6,000 Pharisees. But now we're told he's a member of the ruling council, which would be equivalent in some ways to the United States Senate. It was the ruling, there were 70 men who made up the ruling council. So we know Nicodemus is very religious and he's also very respected and connected to have that high of a level of authority. And he came at night to see Jesus. And he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform these signs that you were doing if God were not with him. And we're told another interesting thing. So Zacchaeus is religious, he's respected. In the Talmud, basically a historical book at the time, we're told he's one of the three richest men in the city of Jerusalem. So he's got riches, he's got respect, he's got religion. And yet he's curious about Jesus. And so he doesn't want to show all of his cards, so he comes at night. Why is that significant? If you were a rabbi going to another rabbi, you'd come in the day. But, you know, Nicodemus is a little insecure about being seen in the daylight. And so he goes and he shows up to Jesus. And he begins to say, 
I, I don't know quite who you are, but no one could do what you're doing if you weren't from God. And without even getting to his question, Jesus answers it and says this, verse four, or verse three. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And Jesus, before he ever asks anything, said, says, ever asks anything, says, you will never see the kingdom of God and the way he's at work in this life and in eternal life unless you have another birth. And Nicodemus is, understandably, he's confused. What, do you, what does that even mean? How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asks. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born, which is a mental image nobody wants to have. Verse five, Jesus answered. Jesus is thinking it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water, physical birth, and the spirit, a spiritual birth. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. In other words, humans give birth to humans, dogs give birth to dogs, cats to cats, and the spirit to spirit. And he highlights, and Nicodemus is hearing for the very first time that maybe where he stands with God and the kingdom of God is not where he thought. Because Jesus is confronting him with the truth that Nicodemus, and it's a truth that maybe you at somewhere would say you kind of know but don't fully believe. Being good doesn't make you good enough for heaven. Being good doesn't make you good with God. I mean, I want you to think about this man. I mean, he's sitting, he's sitting across the table, and he thinks, you know, this is one teacher, and I'm a teacher, and I got a lot of authority, and this new guy, and, you know, maybe we'll share some ideas together. And Nicodemus has spent his entire life devoted to God. We think of the Pharisees, and we kind of think of, like, the, the Klingons or, like, the arch nemesises and the bad guys in Star Wars, whoever that is. But we think of them as, like, these bad guys, but they were men who... If you met them today, they would be at church every week. They were generous with their money. They had memorized, the Pharisees, the first five books of the Old Testament. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And your journey through the Bible, if you do that and you're reading each year and you're going through, most of us struggle to get through those five books of the Bible. I mean, we hit Leviticus sometime in you know, April and we're like, oh, I'm just gonna go to Luke again. And these men <laughs> had memorized and we, in other words, we think of them as like, oh, those bad guys. At the de- time, they weren't thought of as bad guys. If your son grew up to be a Pharisee, it was like, man, you, had, you were winning because you had raised someone that had devoted their life to God. And Nicodemus is being told, you think God accepts you because of what you've done. No, no, no. You, you see the kingdom of God by birth, not work. You will see the kingdom of God by a new spiritual birth, not religious works. And he's sitting there and he's trying to compute it. But Jesus is in the most loving way possible. He's trying to define the relationship and bring clarity to Nicodemus. Like you've spent your whole life and you've missed it. What do I mean by define the relationship? I, I mean, you know, if you think in terms of dating relationships, there's that moment in every dating relationship where eventually you get to a place where you have the DTR, the define the relationship. What does this look like? It's when that stage where you've gone on a few dates, maybe four, maybe three, maybe five, wherever you're at. I'm not talking to you specifically, or maybe I am, but point being, you're in that dating stage and you finish up that date. And almost always, for whatever reason, this happens in the car. You pull up to their apartment or their house and the two of you are sitting there and you're just kind of making chit chat before you wrap up and just say, man, this was great and it's so good to see you. And you're talking and, you know, I got this big presentation tomorrow at work and blah, blah, blah. Inevitably, you kind of stumble into this conversation. It may happen like, you know, one of your phone gets a text and it's your, one of your girls texts you and she's like, how did it go with Kevin? Was it good? I just wanted to know. And Kevin's like, oh, I just saw my name mentioned on there. What are they saying? Oh, I'm nothing. And they're just always like, what's going on with you guys? Like, are you like a thing? Are you talking? Are you dating? It's like, nice. And, uh, and he's like, oh, 
man, my guys are always like that too. They're like, like you and Kelly, like, like what, what is that? And, and you're talking, you're back and forth, and inevitably one of you will go, <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> and based on how you answer that question, it's gonna have some serious ramifications for where you two are headed. You are either gonna go, <laughs> what do you mean what I say? I, I say, you're Kelly. And the friend zone begins, or you're gonna say, uh, you know, I, I say, um, like, you know, we're just dating, and, you know, but I, I would, I'd like her to be my girlfriend. And whew, you're in. And you have defined the relationship. And Jesus, in the most loving way possible, is trying to bring clarity to define the relationship, Nicodemus. You spent your whole life trying to be good for God, thinking being good will make you good with him. And you've bought a lie. Because you will never see heaven by how good of a person that you are. It comes from a spiritual birth. And the analogy of a spiritual birth is pretty brilliant. Because being a father of three, I haven't seen you know, my own kids go through three, there's some striking and fascinating similarities to the spiritual birth and how it takes place. Perhaps one of the more perplexing things when I think about physical, actual having kids birth is the disproportionate load God has distributed to the father and the mother in terms of carrying the child. What do I mean? I mean, the mom has to have, she goes through morning sickness, she gets uncomfortable, she's getting pregnancy pillows, she goes through all of like the body changing. And this is all before even the delivery of all that takes place there and all of the ways that she is carrying the load of bringing this child into the world. And then there's the dad's contribution, <laughs> which is the thing he wants to do and thinks about all the time anyways. And yet perhaps most perplexing of all is the contribution that is even less, and that's of the baby. In other words, in your birth, in my birth, physical birth of any child, the child has nothing to do with deciding and willing and being the one who is responsible for that birth. It's his parents. And in a spiritual sense, that's what Jesus is saying. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Being able to see the kingdom of God is an act only the spirit of God can produce. And he's talking about the miracle of, you know, theology or seminaries and basically masters in Bible schools will we'll call regeneration, of being made this new life that God births. And Nicodemus is realizing every category and understanding of who God is, is being exploded. And realizing, man, being good doesn't make you good with God. And here's where this hits home, I think, in the room. There's certain of us that think, man, God's Love for me or my relationship with him or my ability to show up and feel like I'm good with God is dependent on how well I've been doing recently. How much my church attendance, whether or not I'm still looking at pornography or whether or not I'm still messing up sexually. All of which are commands that God gives not for you to earn his love, but to experience his love. But those are not the reason or basis we can have a relationship with God. So there's that camp that think, man, if I'm good, then I, I'm good with God. And then there's the other camp, and I think this is more common in my experience, of people who think, oh, man, that sounds so good. Oh, you just don't know what I've done. And you're still believing the same lie. But it's your behavior that determines your ability to have a relationship with God or to have eternal life. And Jesus, he's just getting started, but he's just blowing the categories, Nicodemus. You've been wrong. And then in verse 7, he says, you shouldn't be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. He says, just like you feel the wind blowing against the trees or against yourself, there's things you don't fully understand, but they're undeniably real. So it is when the Spirit of God begins to impact someone's life. And then verse 9, and he's going to tell us the evidence of that new birth in someone's life. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. Jesus said, you are Israel's teacher, 
And do you not understand these things? This is the ultimate, do you even lift, bro? You are Israel's teacher? Like, you're not just a teacher. You are the teacher of Israel. You're the guy everyone wants to listen to your podcast. Your TED Talk explodes. People want to know your advice on things. They want to know some people's advice on different things. Everyone wants to know your advice when it comes to anything spiritual. And you don't understand this? And Nicodemus is realizing his understanding of God is not what he thought. Very truly, I tell you, verse 11, Jesus says, we speak of what we know and testify to what we've seen, but you don't accept it. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Basically, you don't understand this. There's not a lot more deep I can go with you. And then he gives the hinge point. He basically says, Nick, give me some, let me break it down a step further. Just as Moses, verse 14, lifted up a snake in the wilderness. Okay, let me hit pause here. He just said, just, Jesus is sitting across, Nicodemus is sitting there going, okay, I'm, I'm trying to follow. He says, all right, let me give you an illustration. And Jesus references a story he would have known all about. It's a story in the book of Numbers that Nicodemus had memorized. And he references this random kind of obscure story that if you're not familiar with a lot of the Old Testament, you probably maybe you've never even heard of. And he references this time in Israel's history. Israel's the people of God in the Old Testament. And they were out in the desert and there were these serpents that showed up and this nation was being attacked by this huge horde of serpents. And they were getting bit and they were dying and they cried out to Moses. And they said, do something. And Moses, we're told in the story, this is what Jesus is referencing. Moses goes and he pleads to God, what should I do? And God says, I want you to take a staff and put a rod on it. And I want you to put a serpent made out of bronze on the rod. And I want you to put that in the middle of the camp. And anyone who's been bit that looks at that will be healed and their life will be spared. And Nicodemus is hearing this story and he would be very familiar. To you, you read past that and it's like, did he just mention serpents? I knew this was not the church for us, okay? <laughs> That's not really the point. The point is, just like in that scenario where this staff and rod was lifted up and anyone who looked was healed. He's about to tell us, so it will be with him. But I want you to see a, a picture of what it would have looked like of that crossbeam on a rod with a snake. This is an actual picture from 2,000 years ago. And uh, no, it's not. <laughs> it's a joke, guys. Okay, <laughs> tough crowd. And... Jesus says, just like in that moment, verse 15, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes or trusts in him may have eternal life in him. Now, Nicodemus, he's, he's still confused. and We kind of see the foreshadowing and know what's coming. He's sitting there going, I don't know what you're talking about. Just like a serpent was lifted up in the desert so the son of man, what does that even mean? And then Jesus dropped these two bombs that would have gone, what? He said that everyone who believes, everyone? In other words, Nicodemus, you're so all about the Jewish nation and you are so focused on you know, God's heart. You've bought the idea that God's heart is really just for the Jewish people, that he loves kind of all people generally, but really God's in heaven like, yes, let's go Jews. Give me a J, give me an E, give me a W. Jews, those are my people, I'm all about it. And Jesus just said, no, 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 no. God's heart is for everyone who believes in the Son of Man lifted up. Not who behaves for the son of man who was lifted up. Are you saying it comes down to belief or to trusting? And John, who wrote the book of John, I love this. He's telling the narrative and he's writing it to his audience who would later read it and walk through it. And John knows that Nicodemus may not fully understand, but John sees the big full picture. So John wants to step out of the dialogue and the narrative to punctuate what's happening. And he writes this sentence. And it's 
arguably the most famous sentence in human history. And John pens 26 words that would reverberate through the halls of time ever since they were written. They would be placed on the eye black of NFL players, on the bottom of in and out cups, on the bottom of Forever 21 bags, shown in Super Bowl commercials. And he says, man, let me just, let me punctuate for the reader. This is what God is saying. This is what Jesus is pointing to. For God so loved the world. He was so moved by love that he gave his one and only son, that one who would be lifted up, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. And John says, you're going to get to the end of the story. Nicodemus doesn't understand the sun lifted up like a serpent. What does that mean? And John goes, God so loved the world that he was sending his son to be the payment and savior through his payment of his life on the cross for anyone who would accept his payment for their sin. And Nicodemus is exposed to the second truth that trusting in Jesus as your savior is the only way to get to heaven. In other words, how do you know if you've been reborn? Because the Bible says only those who are reborn will have eternal life. And then it says, and only those who believe in Jesus as the payment and savior for them, and payment of their sin and resurrection from the dead will have eternal life. As in, you know you're reborn. If you have put your faith, your trust in Jesus as your savior, and the payment for your sin. Trusting in Jesus as your savior is the only way to get to heaven. And I'm gonna move quick through this, but he introduces a Greek phrase, believes in. You know what's interesting? Prior to this expression or this verse, there's no record in Greek literature, which is what the New Testament was written in, of that phrase being used. In other words, prior to that, they had believed that. Hey, I believe that. And John says, no, 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 it's stronger than that. It's not just they believe that Jesus died on the cross for them. They believe that Jesus is alive. They believe that God is real. They have believed, or the same Greek word for believe is trust. They have trusted in Jesus as their savior, as the payment for their sin. Those are the ones who will have eternal life. The Bible over and over and over teaches it's not good people in heaven and bad people in hell. It is forgiven people in heaven. And the only way you can have eternal life or be forgiven is to trust in Jesus as the payment for your sin. Which means if I think my sin is too big of a deal for God to have paid for on the cross, I'm believing my sin is stronger than the savior of the world. If I think because of a past abortion, past sexual sin, past pornography, past things that make up your story, my story, are gonna be beyond what God paid for in Jesus. Like that's too much, I gotta earn my way, I gotta do some good things if I'm gonna get back with God. I'm believing that the sin in my life is more powerful than the savior God sent. And Nicodemus is being exposed, man, you're playing a different game. God sent me to be a savior. You know what it takes to receive a savior? And this is why some of you will not spend eternity with God. You have to believe I am incapable on my own of doing what is required to have eternal life, which is to have a perfect life. And I believe that, and there's no amount of good things I could do that can make up for the mistakes that I've had. But the good news is you don't have to, which is why Jesus came into the world, to be your savior, not your homeboy, not a teacher, the savior. But for you to get to that place, you gotta go, man, I am incapable and I wanna earn my way to God, I wanna try and I wanna work harder. That is not how you can have a relationship with God. It starts by accepting the free gift he paid on the cross, everything you've ever done, past, present, sin, three decades from now, you don't even know you're gonna commit when you're a crotchety old man. All of it paid for. And you can golf clap for that, yeah, that's great. And Nicodemus is seeing what, what a lot of people spend their whole life and don't realize. You'll never have eternal life apart from him. And the only reason any of us ever get access to eternal life is not because we deserve it. It's because it's in spite of the fact that we don't deserve it. It's, honestly, it's similar to, like my son, he loves sporting events. And I've noticed something. When you go to a Dallas Stars game or Mavs game or Rangers game or anything, they all require the same thing at the door to get in. 
a ticket. It's really bizarre. Show up, like, oh, we're going to go to this game. And they're like, where's your tickets? You know what's never worked? I've never been able to say, oh, sorry, we don't have tickets. But here's what you got to know. I'm a really great guy, love this kid, we're nice people, pay my taxes, never killed anybody. And so what do you think? Can we get in? They, of course, like you would know, would go, no, where's your ticket? And if I try to repeat, no, 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 no but you don't know. I'm, like I've never cheated on my wife. Uh, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm a pretty nice guy. Can we come in? They go, no. Because it doesn't matter about your behavior. It doesn't work that way. And the paradigm shift Nicodemus is having is Jesus is saying, you're pointing to your list of resumes. It doesn't work that way. You'll never be able to enter. And where the analogy breaks down is that ticket idea. Really, once you get into a sporting event, your ticket is kind of worthless. But Jesus is so much more than a ticket to heaven. He's the means of transformation in this life not just transportation to eternal life. And he, when you trust in him, he begins to change everything, but not because you've earned it or deserve it. And Nicodemus, he's sitting across. Remember what he said? He said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who comes from God. Rabbi is a Greek word for teacher. He says, teacher, we know you're a teacher from God. Nicodemus is also called a teacher. So he starts the conversation going, Man, it's one teacher to another teacher. You've got some opinions. I've got my opinions. And Jesus is going, this isn't teacher to teacher. This isn't even teacher to student. This is savior to sinner. And that's why I'm here. And your rules and obedience, following a teacher, that's religion. Trusting in a savior, that's relationship. And I'm not here for you to follow additional teachings, Nicodemus. And I know many of you, and I'm about to wrap up, week after week, this hasn't hit home. And my prayer tonight is that if one person has it hit home, man, it would be worth every porch we've ever done. Because why do I say it doesn't at home? I have conversations every single week down front. You know what often a lot of them look like? I say, man, this is, they'll ask a question or I want to know more about this. And at some point I'll ask, hey, let me just ask you a question. It's kind of a bizarre out there question, but just curious and I'd love to know. On a scale of one to 10, how confident are you that if you died today, which I hope doesn't happen, you'd go to heaven? 10 being I'm totally confident, one being I'm not at all. And they'll answer and they'll say, you know, uh, that's a good question. Uh, five or seven, nine, all across the board, different answers people give. And then I'll ask another question. Seven, awesome. Why? And the most common answer looks something like this. Well, I'm seven, well, because I, uh, you know, I'm trying to, wrong answer. You and I standing before God and him saying, why would you have eternal life? And answering and responding with any sentence that starts with, because I will never be the answer. Because I on my own and you on your own, believe it or not, are incapable of bridging that gap. And it takes humility to say, I'll never be able to do that. But I accept you did on the cross, what I could never do for me, and you died and you rose again, and I believe it. And if you are there, you can be a 10. Not because I, but I'm a 10 because Jesus. And I know exactly where I'm gonna spend eternity. At some point in this conversation, maybe it clicked, maybe it didn't. We're not told. We're told that Nicodemus leaves and no doubt he's wrestling, just curious, he's not sure, and he goes off and fast forward a few chapters later, we're told the name of Nicodemus again. It's this time where Jesus is doing miracles and he's healing people and they're, he's teaching at the Feast of Booze. T think the Texas State Fair. Jesus is out, Texas State Fair, he's teaching, standing up on something, he's teaching everybody, and he just healed a guy on the Sabbath, which was a big 
you know, don't do it from the Pharisees' perspective. And Jesus is becoming increasingly famous and the religious leadership, that 70 men, that included Nicodemus, they get together and they go, this man must be stopped. We need to arrest him. Let's send the temple guard, which is like most equivalent to the mall cop or something. It's like, uh, you guys are kind of staying in your lane at the temple, but we'll send you out there anyways. And so they go to arrest Jesus and they send him out there. Hours go by, the temple guard comes back, the Sanhedrin, that 70's waiting, going, we're gonna arrest Jesus. And the temple guard shows up and they don't have Jesus. And t- the Sanhedrin, that 70 men, goes, where is he? And they're like, I've never heard anybody speak like this. It was like, it was powerful. And the Sanhedrin just go, you guys listen to a sermon? Like, yeah, I mean, it was, it was really powerful. I mean, Carl gave his life to Jesus and uh, that didn't happen. But point being, they begin to go, okay, this is unbelievable. Fast forward to chapter 11, and in chapter 11, Jesus raises a guy from the dead, and it's decided he must be stopped at whatever the cost. And Nicodemus is watching all of this happen. And then one night, they send the temple guard out again, and Jesus is arrested in a garden. And he's there, and he's praying. And Judas shows up with the temple guard, and they take him back, and they put him on trial, and they put the Son of God on trial, saying, Who do you think you are? At the end of the trial, they declare with those 70 men among whom Nicodemus was present, he's guilty and deserving of death, but we can't kill anyone, so we'll hand him over to Pilate and ask for him to be killed. And if you're Nicodemus, and you're sitting there going, what what has he done? But certainly Pilate's not gonna kill him. He stands Jesus before Pilate, and Pilate says, "What, what what have you done? They say that you claim to be the king of the Jews and Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And Pilate says, this guy may be crazy, but he's not deserving of death. I'm just have him beaten and release him. But the Jewish leaders, that 70 men, begin to incite the crowd. And in John chapter 19, they declare with a crowd around him in front of Pilate, if you release him, you are no friend of Caesar. From then on, verse 19, or verse 12 of chapter 19, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. The Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Eventually, Pilate says, if you want him crucified, you can do that. And he's led away to be crucified. And I want you to think, you're Nicodemus, and you're seeing all of this happen. And this man that you went at night, and you're going, crucify? What has he done? He didn't crucify anybody. It was for the worst of the worst, the murderers, rapists, people who had done things that society there was no coming back from. What has he done? Healed the eyes of blind men, allowed people who'd never been able to walk to walk. He restored families back together when he healed lepers and let them go home. He raised someone from the dead. What has he done that's deserving of death? How can this be happening? And they lead him away and he's crucified. And something happened where it began to click in a way that was different for Nicodemus. And he went from, man, I'm a part of the 70 and they just let him away to, I am coming out in the open and associating with this man, Jesus. I'm not staying in hiding anymore. And after he's dead, Nicodemus, after Jesus dies, he goes and says, man, I I don't care what it costs me. I'm associating with him. And he goes to Pilate and a man named Joseph of Arimathea, John chapter 19 says this, they went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Verse 38, now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. And who was with him? Nicodemus, the man who had visited Jesus earlier at night. And they took the body and the blood of the savior of the world covered their hands and they wrapped it up and they buried him. And three days later, he would rise. Now, when did it begin to click? When did he go from, I'm afraid to be seen with you, to I will be performing your funeral? We don't exactly know, but perhaps it was. On that hill, where Jesus was prepared to be crucified, and Nicodemus shows up, and all he can see is the crowd around in the backs of people's head, and he's looking around, where could Jesus be? And then over the crowd, is raised up the miracle working Messiah, the savior of the world. And maybe it began to click when the son of man 
is lifted up like Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert. Whoever believes and trusts in him, not what they've done, not what they will do, but him as the payment for their sin, they will have eternal life. And something happened where he goes, I'm not staying here anymore, I'm coming out in the open. In fact, church history tells us he went on to become a bishop and eventually a saint recognized in the church. Now, whether or not Nicodemus in church history is accurate, the question is not did he receive Jesus, it's did you? And there's no more important question that you will ever ask or ever answer than that for the rest of your life. Have you accepted him as your Lord, your Savior, the payment for your sin? And he was more than enough. Let me pray. And when I do, I want to do something that we don't do often. And I just want to invite anyone who has never, if you're not a 10, I want to invite you to know that you can be a 10. I am 100% confident I'm where I'm going to spend eternity with God. And anyone in the room who's never had a moment in their life where they've made the decision, I am putting my trust in Jesus as not the miracle man from long ago. He is the savior of my life, of my sin, of everything broken or wrong with me. And I accept you, God. And I want to lead you in that prayer. And so I'm going to pray. And then in a second, I'm going to lead anyone that has not made that decision. And if there is one person, like I said, every porch we've ever done in history is worth it. There is nothing more important than you will ever answer. Father, I pray for anyone who has made that decision, you would deepen our love and affection for you. And I pray for anyone who hasn't, that tonight would be their night and they would make that decision and their eternity would be forever changed and their life in this life would be forever changed. If you're in a room, if you're in the room and you're at a place where you know I've never made that decision or I'm not sure, I'm not confident and I wanna be confident. I don't wanna wonder anymore where I stand with God. I wanna receive and accept the one who was lifted up for me as my savior. I just wanna invite you to raise your hand right where you are. I just wanna lead you in a prayer and then I wanna pray for you. Wherever you're at, right now, you just raise your hand up in the air and there is no more defining decision you're gonna make. And I think God has you here for this reason. I see you all over the room. If that's where you are, let me just lead you in a prayer and you can just pray to yourself this, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I am in need of a savior. And I accept you and what you did on the cross as payment for my sin and your resurrection as proof that payment was more than enough. Would you take my life and use it and I receive the free gift of eternity that is mine because of what you've done out of the great love that you have for me and our world. Amen. Lord, I pray for these friends that just made that decision that you would take the seeds of faith and you would bury them deep into their heart. Thank you for the fact that eternities right now have changed all over the room. I pray for eternities that are changing, for people that are listening. And we thank you, the new life, incredible gift that just happened, that heaven has a celebration, Luke chapter 15 says, that takes place when a single person decides to receive that free gift. And I pray for anyone in this room who sadly has not made that decision and has not accepted that free gift, God, would you graciously bring them to the end of themselves? And would they humbly just say, God, I'm not gonna try to earn it, work my way there, I receive it. We worship you in song, amen.